Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't know, but I may lose some connectivity again. So tell me when that happens, please. Okay, so we are ready to start. Everybody's here. We have 50 participants and people are still joining. So that's a good sign. Okay, so I begin now. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste, assalamu alaikum. This is the 94th edition of our Zoom public meeting. We are fast approaching the 100th edition, the anniversary, and we plan a big celebration on, uh, on this Zoom right here when that time and day reaches. For 93 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday. In the past year, nine months and three weeks, we have featured over 283 presenters from all parts of the world speaking on 93 topics. We wish to thank all those who have contributed in whatever way towards the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian Diaspora project, which I am sure you will agree is historic, pioneering, and professionally executed. Our chairperson today slash tonight is Bindu Devkinath Maharaj of Trinidad and Tobago. She has been an educator for the past 26 years and is a published creative writer. Drawing upon the wealth of her Indo-Trinidadian experience, Bindu explores space, femininity, and identity through her writings. Bindu, welcome and please chair the meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Marbell for that warm welcome. It's always my pleasure to be here. So good night, everyone. Good morning and good evening. Namaste and assalamu alaikum to all of you. Depending on the time zone in which you live, because you know there are always people in this meeting from all over the world. The COVID-19 pandemic is still rampant. We are indeed very, very blessed to be alive here today. So many of our family members and dear ones have passed away. So folks, please remember to take the necessary precautions to save your life and that of your loved ones. Keep your social distance, sanitize, wear your mask and stay at home as much as possible. We would also like to wish, or also like to express our outrage at Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now we have scheduled a Zoom public meeting on its impact on the Indian diaspora for next Sunday, March 27, right here at this time and space. Now tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, the world will observe International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The theme for this year is Voices for Action Against Racism. Now running for almost two years now, this Zoom platform has been highlighting directly and indirectly the need for equitable Indo-Caribbean participation as well as representation in all areas in the Indian diaspora in the region. This Zoom platform is a call to recognize the presence and contribution of the Indians in the diaspora against racial discrimination and the challenges they face. Now, last week, we cited two examples of the marginalization linguistics and literature at the University of the West Indies in its roundtable discussion on literature. We wish to take this opportunity to congratulate our children who topped the CXE Cape regional exams. Now, every year, Hindu, Muslim, and Presbyterian schools in Trinidad and Tobago produce the highest performing students in the nation. 
This year, Lakshmi Girls Hindu College received the most national scholarships, amassing 10, 10 in total. The President's Medal was awarded to Nal Hussein and Nikisha Nanku. This weekend, we are witnessing the continuation of the Christian Lent prayer and fasting period, as we know, as well as the Muslim Shabhi Bharat last night, last Friday of fasting and prayer and Pagwa or Holi. So in commemoration of one of these events, let's see a short four minute video of how Holi is celebrated in Guyana. Ravan, you can go ahead and show the video now. Okay, quite an interesting insight into the landscape, culture, and people of Guyana. And in the chat, you see you, there's this question as to um, it's the timing, the time period of it. 
So despite the time in which this video would have been taken, it indeed is a good, excellent representation of the festival being celebrated in Guyana. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. And like today, we often partner with the Amina Gafu Institute for the study of indentureship and its legacies led by Professor David Dabedin. In order to continue this weekly program and to make it bigger and better, we are asking you to kindly give us your suggestions as well as a donation. Please contact Dr. Mahabir for details. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our moderator this evening slash tonight is Shalima Muhammad. So let me tell you a bit about Shalima. She's a business teacher and a researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. She obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. And she's a very strong advocate for health and wellness practices based on traditional and alternative healing. Shalima, nice to have you here again. Welcome, please take over from here. Thank you so much, Bindu. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Namaste and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Like most of the others, today's public meeting will take the form of a panel discussion. So kindly mute your microphone unless you have to speak. The microphone icon or symbol is at the lower left corner of your screen. Background noise can be a little distracting and we'd like to avoid that. Over the next two hours, we will be talking about Indian businesses in the diaspora, from indentureship to entrepreneurship. Indians in the diaspora have been found to excel in six areas of activity in society. Agriculture, which is why many of us would have moved from India, engineering, law, medicine, education, and business. Their success evokes more envy than resentment and emulation from the rest of society. Their commercial visibility has made them targets of criminal activity such as home invasions, robberies, kidnappings, and violent attacks. In most of the countries in which they have made their homes, they dominate the wholesale and retail trade in grocery, liquor, and roti shops, as well as jewelry, hardware stores, and supermarkets. Many Indian retail businesses are now being sold to Chinese immigrants, while Indians withdraw to the passive role of a landlord with some of them sending their children to live abroad to escape the violence. In Jamaica, minority Indians are also visible in horse racing as jockeys and horse owners. In Suriname and Guyana, Indians constitute the elite, that is 1% of the society. Indian businessmen in Guyana own commercial banks, light aircraft, insurance companies, rum distilleries and manufacturing industries and may well be the richest among their associates in the Caribbean. So today we are going to hear from some esteemed speakers to tell us why Indians excel and uh, why some Indians excel and some Indians can continue to do so and how some of us can join those ranks. Our first speaker tonight is Mr. Vijaya Kumar Kamar from India. He is the director of global marketing with more than 30 years of experience as a business development and marketing chief executive in the forging, casting and CNC machining industry. He has a global presence as a presenter and a trainer in culture in economics, management and agriculture. It is my pleasure to welcome you, sir. Please go ahead and present. You have 12 minutes. Thank you, namaste. namaste. Uh, just a minute. Thank you, uh, Shalima Mohammadji, and thank you, Bindu Maharajji. Uh, today's uh, presentation is about Indians in business in the diaspora. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the importance of culture in this because the rest of the, the, rest of the issues are uh, taken care of uh, by my fellow um, speakers. So I would like to talk about the 
culture in business in today's uh, presentation business in indian diaspora i'd like to talk about the importance of culture in business which is the core strength of our uh, indians india is not just another country perhaps it is one of the most uh, longest living civilization in, in the world indian business economic management models operate on a very different scale of paradigm we call it as a vasudhaiva kutumbakam meaning the whole world is one family economy and uh, a business model dates back to 5300 bc or uh, reminds us indus valley civilization indians uh, who migrated to different parts of the world are involved in uh, various activities like agriculture manufacturing trading and ally, uh, allied activities apart from uh, industries and other uh, six sectors uh, what dr shalima mohammed ji just not told so culture in the indian uh, diaspora is even though suffering from a uh, strong influence of apartheid from uh, just a minute apartheid uh, people from india made their home there we call these countries as rainbow nations uh, i mean uh, the countries where indians have migrated because of multicultural diversity if uh, for example caribbean islands east european countries uh, south africa mauritius fiji islands papua new guinea and many other countries uh, wherever india have uh, indians have gone we call them as a rainbow nations because of the multicultural uh, diversity initially uh, businesses uh, flourished uh, there in agriculture and allied activities because it was uh, largely influenced by hindu culture of uh, mostly the adaptability later other businesses like textile manufacturing industries tourism etc flourished i'll uh, just to uh, take two minutes i'll go back to the history of uh, business uh, organization of economic cooperation and development that is oecd uh, requested uh, mr angus madison to do research uh, of world business climate from 0 to 2000 ce i am uh, taking back to you around uh, 2000 years uh, economic history angus madison was a world leading british economist specializing in quantitative macro economic history analysis of uh, economic growth he was emeritus professor at the faculty of economics at the university of groningen angus madison and his uh, team of 79 scholars uh, did the research on the world economic development from 0 to 2000 ce in 2001 angus madison and his team published uh, their research work in the name of uh, the book name is the research book name is the world economy a millennium perspective so this uh, um, research book says india was the richest land on the planet from 0 to 1800 ce these are the ex excerpts from the uh, this uh, research book uh, india used to be called as a sone ki chudiya the uh, golden parrot so india was attracted by uh, traders all across the globe so in this book uh, there is a mention about the cultural revolution brought the disciplined business climate by indians across the globe wherever the indians have gone by the uh, cultural heritage uh, which has been inherited from their uh, um, families they have created a very good uh, business disciplined business climate by the indians across the globe this uh, point has been mentioned in the in this research book while considering the uh, tremendous influence of religion and culture in indian society there was a steady rise in bringing the social change in economic de development based on the culture this is the moment of uh, glory and recognition globally for the indian culture in business climate this is especially i am uh, i am highlighting this because indians wherever they have gone they were like a, a sugar in the milk that's what the indians um, uh, strength is so in uh, zero, at uh, zero ce the india was producing around 32.9% of the total world's gdp because india was a leading uh, producer of the world followed by china 26.1% africa it was producing around 6.90% us and uk both put together they were producing only 2% of the world's economy so rest of the world was following the india so this is the indian's strength which was the leader of uh, uh, world's uh, economic uh, product producing country so i'll uh, quickly take you to the uh, facts and figures in the which has uh, appeared in the book uh, india 
in uh, 0 CE it was producing 32.90 percent in 1750 it was producing around 24.4 percent of the world GDP you look at this in 1850 India was producing only 2.8 percent of the world GDP slowly slowly it recovered in 2015 it uh, uh, recovered up to 5.5 percent today we are in a commendable position around 8 to 9 percent we are producing but look at this uh, US and UK which were producing only 2 percent was to around 44 percent 1850 so this 2.8 percent of the world's GDP was mainly due to the colonial exploitation by the British uh, this is this is the brief history of the world economy this uh, this is a very huge subject because right from 0 to 2000 CE the 79 scholars and the Angus Madison they have drawn the economic history it uh, talks about various aspects of the culture uh, business climate the people and other things I have given a very brief history of the uh, economic growth or the business growth now I would like to bring in the uh, United Nations here after the World War II, United Nations saw and understood some of the countries were reeling under the poverty and hunger. In 1951, United Nations President Mr. Louis Narvo and World Bank's Chairman Mr. Eugene Black directed the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, this is we call it as a DESA, to arrange conference to discuss about how to develop the underdevelopment, uh, underdeveloped nations. Because after the World War II, the bombing and other things happened, most of the countries were reeling under poverty and hunger. United Nations um, uh, thinking was to how to bring out, uh, how to remove this poverty and hunger. So they have called the conference to discuss this. So representatives from uh, 60 plus countries took part in the session. They discussed for about uh, two days and finally they have released a document by name, a policy statement, 3rd May 1951. So I will read out uh, the statement as it is because it gives a seriousness what they are going to tell. There is a sense in which a rapid economic progress is impossible without painful readjustments. Ancient philosophies have to be scrapped. Old social institutions have to disintegrate. Bonds of caste, creed and race have to burst. Very few communities are willing to pay the full price of the rapid economic progress. This was the statement made by the uh, uh, United Nations in 3rd May 1951. Now let us understand what this statement says. Give up uh, traditional values, culture and the past. The family models should be uh, destroyed. Need to forget ancient philosophies and many other religious activities. This is, uh, uh, this, the, this is the excerpt from the uh, statement. At the end of the report added a line, scrap the ancient economic models they have practicing so far. They gave us a formula, best for the rest to follow the best. It means follow the free market business model or the Anglo-Saxon model what we call in the economic theories. So uh, the policy what the United Nations gave, the underdeveloped countries started implementing the policy given by United Nations and the World Bank to come out of the poverty and hunger at the earliest. This model of economy was monitored and studied both by UN and World Bank for about 50 years. But the model was not effective as expected. I am not saying it is unsuccessful. It was not ex ex effective as expected. To study what went wrong, United Nations arranged another conference in 2001. This time 150 country plus countries participated in this uh, uh, program. So in 2001 April, when they have concluded the meeting, they have uh, given uh, one more opinion. That means they have revised their opinion. They say there is no fetal model of development. To sustain the growth, it requires key criteria to be met. There is no unique combination of policies and institutions fulfilling them. Development must be driven by culture and tradition. And the, this is the Mm, uh, what you can say punchline from the 2001 development must be driven by culture and the tradition along with the western, western model of economy so the, what they are uh, telling is you take the western model of economy but each and every country has its own culture and this culture has to drive the economy of, the, of their country so in the 12th century uh, socio-economic uh, reformer Sri Basveshwara who advocated uh, equality in the society he uh, Basveshwara and his team of around 770 Sharanas, 
they were working on the uh, equality in the society. So one uh, verse, uh, we call it as a vachana in uh, Kerala language, so which depicts the culture in the economy. I'll uh, 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 read the verse as it is. Kanchana vemba naya nechi nima marede naya, kanchana ke vele yalla de, linga ke vele yalla, hadi ke ye mechi da sonaga, amruta da ruchiya balla de, kodala sangama deva. This is the, 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 this is written in Kannada. So I will translate now. Attracted towards gold like a dog. I completely forgotten you, my lord. I have time to earn gold. I don't have time to worship you, my lord. Worship means that is the culture. How can a dog know the taste of ambrosia? Ambrosia means amrit. When it is attracted towards the rotten meat. Now let us understand this vachana. To say that the model is culture, cultural based business model, UN and uh, World Bank took uh, almost around 50 years of uh, real time research and the groundwork. This uh, classic thought process was successfully implemented in the 12th century by socio-economic reformer Sri Vasaveshwara, which brought the breeze of equality among the all classes of the society. I am talking of the all the classes of the, the society wherever the Indians were there. Gold is equated to business and worship, worshipping linga equated to the culture like a dog attracted to towards a staunch meat it's like embracing the business forgetting the culture is symbolically represented here business without culture will not flourish is the theme of this vachana <coughs> sorry so in the indian diaspora what is the uh, uh, importance of culture business and culture are inseparable we can see this in the uh, diaspora even today with many diverse multicultural and vibrous, vibrant religious society, Indian diaspora still holds the families, family values even today. Very interesting part of business in Indian diaspora is the hierarchy decision making. So what we call it is the Maslow's uh, theory of uh, pyramid. So hierarchy decision making still which is the core ethics of our uh, family values we inherit from our ancestors. Best part of the culture is dealing with people and not with the artificial institutions. This is the punchline we have to remember. This collective culture is the backbone of a flourishing business climate. The various businesses are Indian origin such as agriculture, tourism, textile to the Indians who are migrated to their uh, these territories. <coughs> with this, I would like to conclude only by saying the only hope the world is looking is business and economy driven by culture, which is our own 7,500 years of business model. We have 1,800 years of glorious economy is a testimony for the world. Under the economic recession due to Corona pandemic, the world is crumbling is an opportunity for India. We are in a very, very difficult time, but in a very, very interesting time. 20 years from now is a testing time for India and India will rise definitely. We are seeing the rise of India, but India is not rising enough is a challenge. We need to correct it to rise enough to see India on the top of the world. So these are the, some of the references uh, I have uh, referred. So with this, I conclude by saying thank you Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. Thank you Amina Gafur Institute for the excellent uh, opportunity. I am humbled and honored really. Thank you Dr. Kumar Mahabir sir, Bindu Maharajji and uh, Dr. Shamila Mohammadji, thank you to brothers and sisters across the globe for patient listening. Thank you once again and Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very, very much for sharing those insights. I wish we had more time to give you so you could have spoken a lot more about um, Babaswana, that theory. Basavishwara. Basavishwara. Yes, yes. So um, I really would love to hear a little more about that, but hopefully later in the Q&A, you can expand on it. Thanks a awesome. lot. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Namaste. Great. Namaste. So our second speaker is Mr. Jean-Claude Escalante from Trinidad. He has a BA in Business Administration from the University of New Brunswick in Canada. He's the author of the book, From Indentureship to Entrepreneurship, which was published last year. His second book entitled What's on My Mind is a collection of essays on political, social, economic, and racial issues. So we look forward to hearing about that. Jean-Claude, welcome. You have 12 minutes. Go ahead, please. Thank you for the introduction. And to you, uh, 
Uh, this is an esteem panel. I believe this is the first time I've been called esteem, so I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Kamara, thank you for that pre uh, presentation. I was absolutely Chateau, excited. Chateau, excuse me. Um, there is an echo. Okay. We're not hearing you quite clearly. I am now. A little better. Yes. Just now, yes. Better now? A bit, a little bit, That's yes. Right. Go ahead. And... All right. Yeah. So, right. so, I'm the author of this book here from Inventorship to Entrepreneurship The Rise of East Indian Peasantry. Can you hear me, Shalima? Yes. Hello? Hello, we're hearing you. Shalima, can you hear me? Yes, yes we're, we're hearing, hearing you. you. We're hearing you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps. So although the book is uh, subtitled The Rise of the right. Although the book is subtitled The Rise of the East Indian Peasantry in Trinidad, what makes this study complete is that it has an international perspective. It looks at the wider world. And I believe too much of our local thinking is insular in that our perspective we limit it to this two by two island we live in. And we try to take this limited perspective and apply it to the broader world. Whereas I believe what we need to do is try to understand the wider world we live in and bring it down to our level and see how where we fit into that. So the very topic of indentorship alone, we have a very isolated way of thinking about indentorship because of how indentorship was introduced to Trinidad. We think of indentorship as a program that essentially replaced slavery or substituted for it and directly followed it. In reality, indentorship existed for centuries on the other side of the world. There were societies where indentorship and slavery coincided. For example, in Africa, not only did you have slavery, but you had the system of pawnship, the French had engagement. Eastern Europeans, they were also indented servants. As a matter of fact, if you were in debt, you could have volunteered to become an indented servant to pay off your debt. So it's a very old institution. And that the ship itself is as old as slavery. Is that, it's, just, it's just to show that how we often at local level treat with issues. We don't treat in depth enough with it. We just think of it in a local context. So I'm going to show my presentation now. So my presentation will essentially be, it's the final chapter of my book, which is, called, which is called The Road to Riches. And it looks at how Indians made progress to their path in entrepreneurship. And what I discuss in this book is that it's a unique phenomenon, but at the same time, it's one that's easily explainable because the pattern of basically that rags to riches story is found among other ethnic groups around the world. It's not just Indians, it's the Jews, it's the Lebanese. It's the Chinese. All around the world, you have these ethnic minority groups that rose to entrepreneurial prominence. So the first thing I want to do, the first thing the book established, actually, is to de deconstruct some of the narratives we've had in our society. And the first of that being is Africans were lazy and did not want to rule the land. Now, the common narrative is that slavery was abolished and Africans just didn't care for agriculture, so they had to bring in Indians. Well, that's not true. As a matter of fact, the experiment with indentured servants began even before slavery was abolished in 1806 when the Portuguese were brought, because they always knew once slavery was going to become abolished, it's going to be a challenge to fill, to get people to hold the land. And it's not because Africans were inherently lazy or anything like that, but those arguments, and I'll get into that further. But the second populist narrative, which my book really, really focuses on, is this one, Indians get money and land, as I put in local finance, because we often have this jaded view of reality that Indians are where they are today because of the land grants that were given to them. And that is not true. First to begin, as a matter of fact, throughout the 19th century, even the first half of the 20th century, Africans were economically ahead of Indians. By 1829, more than half of the colored population were free. So you had many Africans already working and getting paid. By the time slavery was abolished, the vast majority of Africans, they went on to become shopkeepers. They applied their skills as, as, as artisans and they went even into the agricultural sector. Most importantly, the whole argument that Indians got land and money, which is why they are where they are today, makes no sense from a chronological point of view. It's just illogical when you look at the timeline because slavery was abolished in 1838 and then the first Indian immigrants arrived in 1845. That's a seven year gap already. Then the system of indentorship was actually suspended due to allegations of abuse. 
So it, it was restarted in the 1850s, but true immigration did not begin until the 1860s. So you're looking at an entire generation of Africans who would have had a head start on Indians anyway. So the first myth of Africans didn't want to work land. That's not true. What they actually shunned was plantation labor. They didn't want to work on the estates because they could have taken their labor and go somewhere else and get more money, which is as high as 60 cents a day after the abolition of slavery. So in the ship was in essence, a way to impose a minimum wage law on Indians so that the plantation owners could keep their labor costs down because they were so high after the abolition of slavery. Cocoa farming especially was dominated by Africans. It was the bread and butter for many. And by 1889, many Africans born to uh, cocoa farmers were going abroad receiving a college education. What ultimately led to Africans departing from the cocoa farming industry was basically the collapse of it with the witches broom disease that took over and created a lot of the crops. And that's what eventually took away. In addition to, of course, the spoils of education, the more educated you get, the less likely you want to work with your hands. You know how it is, right? There's that cultural stigma attached to agriculture once you reach a certain level of education. So the point is, in Africans were economically and even you know, from an educational perspective ahead of Indians during this time. And the second thing is that, the second myth is that Indians got land after president, and that's not true. The first crown land in Trinidad and Tobago, the steel of crown land was actually sold to Africans and Venezuelans before the Indians. And that's something a lot of people don't know, is that they were the first to receive the first grant of, I shouldn't say grant because they have to pay a dollar an acre for it, but they were the first to get, you know, crown land available to them. But most importantly, land in lieu of passage, this was only available to Indians from 1869 to 1880. The program was suspended by 1880, and the major reason for it is that most of this land was not good. It simply, the soil couldn't bear much. The, the drain, it was poor, there was poor drainage. Uh, and there was one instance, actually, where the Crown government actually sold land that was owned by someone to an Indian, and the owner had to come back and take his land. So there were a lot of problems, a lot of legal and administrative problems with the distribution of these lands. Ultimately, it was abandoned. And out of the 144,000 immigrants that came to the Trinidad, only 2,463 received land grants. So th this narrative that, you know, I actually read a social studies textbook the other day because I have a cousin who's in Form 3 or Form 4, something like that. But it actually said in the book, the vast majority of Indians receive land. And that's just not true. So it goes to show you how this myth is still perpetuated, even at the secondary school level in 2022. So what my book essentially focuses on, it tries to show how the cultural pattern, this is something Dr. Kamara touched on. There's a cultural pattern among Indians that's also found among other ethnic groups, other ethnic groups that's primarily responsible for their success. And it's not this, it's not this unique phenomenon that you can't explain it. If you just look at other ethnic groups, the, the answer is there. You have the Jews in the United States, Lebanese in Africa, Indians in East Africa, Christians in the Arab world. They are come from a fraction of the population, but they dominate as much as 50% of the industry. For example, the Chinese in the Philippines. Although they are come from only 2% of the population, their share of market capital is 50 to 55%, and they dominate in, in supermarkets, they dominate in, in pharmacies. There's actually, I'm sure everyone knows the term Alibaba. I'm not familiar with that, with that term, where you have Ali as the front owner and Baba as the real owner in the back, and that's how it is in Malaysia with the Chinese. So there are certain characteristics of middlemen minorities. Now, although Indians in Trinidad, they're not a true minority, they're not 1% or 2%, right? As a matter of fact, they're the majority now, not by much, I think it's like 36% or 37%. Although Indians aren't truly middleman minorities in that sense, they do share similar characteristics. And the first is that they begin their journey as sojourners to the land. When the Indians came, they had no intentions of staying. Their original intention was just to make money and get back to India to feed their family and whatnot. It's the same with the Jews. It's the same with the, uh, the Christians uh, who were fleeing persecution in the Middle East. It's the same with the Chinese, the Japanese in Brazil. All of them came to these countries with the idea of just saving money to go back. So because of that, that I, it's that goal of just saving money, thrift became a very, very important cultural value for them. And one of the most interesting things I came across in my research is that in 1892, the Kuli deposits accounted for 66,000 pounds out of 157,000. That's how much money they were saving 
back in 1892. And it's not hard to understand why, at the end of the day, the, the local population, the Creole population, they didn't have that reason to save that money. They weren't trying to get as much money as possible to go back. They had the security of a house, they had the security of family life. They would have been a little bit more, you know, they would have been spending a lot more than the Indians would have. Most importantly, they would have selected occupations that are not binding to the country. So that's why you would have found Indians in industries like money lending. That's why they're in retail, because you don't want to set up a manufacturing firm, all this plant and machine. You can't take that back with you. You have to try to sell it. The goal is you want to get goods and try to peddle them, sell them as much as possible, get the money quick, quick turnover, and return it back to your home. But once you develop this capital, you realize, well, I've, I've accumulated a mass, I've quite I've a mass amount of capital here. I could do something with this. So then it's like, well, why would I go back home? I can take this money and do something with it. And that's how you find them invested in land. They were, then they went to invest in groceries. A lot of a lot of these estates had Indian owned shops. The Indian the, the Indians were buying from shops on the estate that were owned by you know former indented servants. And then this is, I think, a very important point as well about middleman minorities is that they develop an ethnic enclave where they become very, I don't want to use the word, they're very uh, you know, protective and very together and they don't allow outsiders. But they, they, because it's so important to keep that value system and they, they're still an outsider in the land as much as they're living here, they tend to get a, a very close community bond. And one of the most interesting things I came across was a parallel between Lebanese families in West Africa and Indians right in Trinidad, the Lebanese, the children of Lebanese parents often went to school within the community or with other Lebanese students, just like how the Mahasaba would have set up schools for the Indian children within the community. The, I shouldn't say the Mahasaba really, but the original Mahasaba, because there was a Mahasaba before the Mahasaba, but, um, it, and they would be Lebanese children would also help out in their shops, their parents' shops, just like all the local Indians. One of them was Jang Bahudu Singh, he would, his mother was often to them the minister of finance of the house. She would take their money, teach them how to save, so that kind of thing. So it became a very close knit family uh, cultural bond as well that passed on those values. So that's the, the, that's the main cultural aspects of the Indian, of the indented Indians that really led to their economic rise. It wasn't land grants or anything like that, which is the common narrative. And what's funny about the, the land grant argument, the irony of it all is that because of that populist narrative that Indians got land, this led to Eric Williams in the 1960s giving Africans land. He gave land grants to Africans because of this narrative. And the thing is, we are much closer to 1962 than we are to 1862. And you won't hear anyone say, well, Eric Williams gave Africans land, but you will hear this narrative being thrown around all the time. So I just want to end off here a bit with some of the early industries that were dominated by Indians. Uh, cinema operators were a big one, of course, because a, a lot of the cultural retention of the early Indians, and even today, is through Bollywood films. So that was a big industry throughout the 1940s, 50s. Even today, it's still a big industry. Uh, transport contractors, carting was a big thing. They would load up their, their goods by the ports, and they would actually pedal these goods. They would walk to however far they have to walk and pedal these goods through the towns where you know, where most people would not go. And that's another reason why they were, they were able to be so successful. They were going into places that were not accessible by other businesses or other business owners who didn't want to take that chance. And a very interesting one I came across in my research was racehorse owners. Apparently, racehorse and horse racing was a big thing for Indians even back as, as late as the 19th century. So that was really interesting. And I just want to give an example of some prominent early Indians. There was one by the name of Bharat Singh. And Bharat Singh was an interesting case because you know the argument that all the Indians that came were low caste. There's always that argument that they came from low caste. That's not true. Bharat Singh came from a very wealthy family in India. For whatever reason, he found himself in Trinidad with his brother and some of his friends. And they were on the estate and they were able to accumulate so much wealth over the years that they managed to actually purchase an estate. And there were a few other Indians who also purchased estates as well. So it wasn't like Baratin was a anomaly among them. There were quite a few. And those Indians actually went into cocoa farming later on and coconut farming as well. Um, Arjun, Rohi, Hanan, and Joppy were resource owners, the most successful at the time. Joppy in particular earned $1,595 in 1877, which was a lot of, which was a lot of money to be. So back in 87, 1877 had to have been a lot as well. 
And there was actually one resource owner. He was so successful in Trinidad that he went to Guyana and became even more successful. And of course, I think Gokul is, I think everyone should know the name Gokul. He was a cartman to a cinema operator. And his perhaps his most important legacy is that he founded the construction of the St. James Mosque. Uh, I think a great book to read to learn more about the Indian ancestry of these people and the prominent Indian society is uh, Eight, Eastern, Eight Eastern Immigrants by Father David Vile. It's an absolute must read. And uh, that takes me to the end of my presentation. I would like to once again thank everyone for having me on this panel. It has been an honor and privilege to share my ideas. Thank you to all the viewers for listening. I hope that I imparted some knowledge and I hope that this discussion was enlightening. Thank you. Most certainly, Jean-Claude. Thank you very, very much for those insights. Ex excellent presentation. And I wish we had more time as well to hear you. Unfortunately, we don't. And I hope that the question and answer will give you a little more time to share more information on your analysis. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our third speaker is a living legend. And at this point, we would like to acknowledge Mrs. Amina Gafoor, and we would like to thank her for establishing the Amina Gafur Institute, which is the co-host of this program. Our third speaker is Mr. Sator Gafur of Guyana. He is the chairman of the Gafur conglomerate based in Guyana with businesses in Barbados, Grenada and St. Lucia. He has been named in the Who's Who of the World, 1999 to 2000. Gafurs has become a household name in Guyana, but standing tall behind this empire is a simple private man who has braved many storms to become one of Guyana's most successful businessmen, turning a small business of two employees into a conglomerate deserving of international pride. I'm honored to welcome you, sir. Please go ahead and present. You have 12 minutes. I am not sure if he's here. Um, seeing Amina Gafur um, as a participant, I'm also seeing connecting to audio. So I'm wondering if they're having connection issues. Okay, at this point in time, if Mr. Gafur um, is not with us, Perhaps we can move on to our next speaker and uh, we probably need to get in touch with him. Dr. Mahavir, please get in touch with him to let him know that um, he should probably reconnect. I did. Okay. But I'll right. keep on trying. Thank you. So sorry about that, everyone. At this point, I'd like to bring on then our fourth presenter who is um, Mr. Himraj Ramdath from Canada. He's originally from Trinidad. He's a business consultant and researcher who has spent the past four decades working globally in the energy and fast moving consumer goods sectors. Himraj holds degrees in political science, economics, and he also holds an executive MBA. He guest lectures in business and the community with IUDI University in Cameroon in Africa. Warm welcome to you, Himraj. Please go ahead, do your presentation. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here. Nice to have you. Okay, everybody can hear me and see me? Yes. 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 Excellent. Okay, well, first of all, greetings and thanks for this platform to highlight the Indian men and women entrepreneurs who against all odds have achieved and continue to contribute so much to Trinidad and Tobago's development. I start with, um, I, I begin to look at the land use in Trinidad during and um, uh, a couple of years before um, uh, in, introduction of Indians to, to, uh, um, to Trinidad. And you notice that uh, between 1838 and 1845, during the period of um, emancipation, um, and until the arrival of Indians into Trinidad, oh, less than 3% of the total land use, the arable land, was used for agriculture. In spite of the fact that Trinidad, 85% of the economy or the GDP was via agriculture, which was very interesting because 
if you have 3% of the, of the uh, land under cultivation, um, and that is equal to 85% of your GDP, you really have some issues because um, during the, 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 the period of the 40s to 45, when there was no um, uh, labor or un, in, uh, unsustainable labor available, um, as the uh, African slave moved out of the plantation, 52% of those very estates had filed for bankruptcy or abandoned, again, because of, of sugar prices and lack of labor. But you here it is with the introduction of Indian, Indian um, indentureship um, between 1845 and 1920, land use increased 12-fold, um, other crops 30 times, uh, cocoa cultivation 22 times, although not only because of Indian um, involvement, and sugar cultivation twice. Of, uh, so the biggest impact of that was Indian cane farmers who actually entered into um, sugar production, cane farming, um, as a result of um, um, uh, their either ownership of land or uh, um, uh, rentals of land, or contract sampling of lands. So by 1880, early 30s, you have 2,000 uh, registered farmers. Um, by 1920, you had almost 14,000, earning uh, approximately $1.6 million in 1920 currency, which is equal to maybe, uh, I think, $253 million today. Um, and this was done under about 14,000 acres of land. And this is land that they own, not what was um, also rented. So by 1920, at the end of indentureship, Indian owned about 140,000 acres of land. What did they do with this land? First of all, you see there's a shift from cocoa and coffee, uh, from sugarcane, sorry. 45% um, of the land was um, used for cocoa. 10% uh, for coffee, and of course they introduced rice. 10% of the uh, land was for rice, um, and, and uh, then the, the rest was uh, different products, including housing settlement, leasing, etc. So by the end of indentureship, you had about 20% of all the land, arable land now under cultivation. The result of this at the end of indentureship, therefore, was that you see there was about already about 19,000 um, entrepreneurs, people running their own business. Again, 70% was still in agriculture uh, because of the uh, cane farmers, uh, cocoa farmers, and small farmers here. But there was been a shift in, um, in merchants, uh, shopkeepers, uh, real estate proprietors, etc. So you had the shift um, from sugar into cocoa, you had a shift about four, four, four to five percent of the of the um, entrepreneurs involved in um, shops and, and um, peasant farming, etc. Um, and very interesting, twelve percent of those people were women. So what what created this transformation? The transformation between this where they were before and what we have here today. Um, so the basis of the transformation, of course, is the income derived from sugar, from agriculture, uh, cocoa, coffee, short crops, et cetera, shopkeeping, transport, as Jean-Claude just mentioned. Um, but it was also facilitated by a few other factors. One is the introduction of um, uh, um, education by the Canadian missionaries. Two, the expansion of the railway system that now connected the sugar belt for the first time. Uh, three, the discovery of oil in Trinidad. And because Indians owned a lot of the real estate um, and the land, the royalty payments on, those real, on that land was significant. Um, and then finally, World War I and World War II, which created uh, a significant increase in demand for goods and services at, at very good profits. So now I, I turn now to the actual companies that have been involved in business. And you would note that I call this legacies because these are people, companies or individuals who have been in business since and during indentureship. 
they began business in uh, as indentured laborers or free free people free people free indians after indentorship so here you have rahmat for example they created their, their their business was established in 1888 so you talk about 134 years ago but two brothers 120 years ago they started again as as uh, jacques talk about uh, this he started as a cartman doing moving uh, uh, sugarcane from the estate to the factories and then moved into taxi service real estate development um, funeral service etc and still today continues to be one of the uh, premier representative of of of, of, of some um, um some major brands um and you know so so these are the the, the first set of companies they are all more than 100 years old um uh, who has been in Trinidad doing business and continue to do so up to today I then moved to the risk takers, the guys who I consider to be pioneers, those who went, the Indian families who went into businesses for the first time. And you have Amar Motors who started um, with um, uh, Toyota Motor Assemblies, um, Jai Ram Kisun, and very interesting because he started as a rice and cane farmer, a charcoal burner, um, and went into poultry, um, and feed mills, etc., uh, has invested significant amount of money into that. And then you have people like Jan Bahadur Singh, who, with ninety dollars in his pocket, with his brother, moved into Port of Spain as a cloth merchant selling cloth on the street, then adding some stores, then um, um, putting down a shirt factory, and became the largest in the Caribbean, and then went move then into, into, into real estate. Of course, uh, the fast moving consumer goods is my baby. Um, uh, principally, again, 95% of the, of the business in this sector are contributed by, um, by the small, small and medium sized business. Um, you have uh, about 75% of all retail, all companies in the sector is Indian owned. Um, you have uh, extra foods with, with, with six locations. Um, you have um, MS Food City here in DAB, started as a small under the shop uh, company uh, or business, and now is the largest single supermarket in, 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 in DAB. Um, Bhagwan Singh, the same thing. Uh, Pasad is interesting because Pasad now is in. in all in several different sectors, um, food, um, bakeries, etc. And we must not forget the other 2,500 odd vendors, market vendors, or small farmers who continue to sell their products in the 20 municipal markets and roadside vending. Then I moved to manufacturing, transport, and construction, um, where so many SMG, for example, a company started in 1924, is currently in 65 countries with 10 manufacturing plants outside. Uh, so it is significant. A junior Sami, this construction company is the largest in the Caribbean, um, uh, in especially the development of roads and airports. We mentioned earlier that Trinidad and Tobago was a, a an energy province since 1915. Um, and replace uh, um, uh, agriculture as the number one earner and contributor to GDP. So, of course, um, the, all these companies here, Indian owned again, are all supporting in the um, um, search for oil uh, and maintenance of, of the oil industry. Uh, but you have a case where um, Tiad Ramnath, for example, here actually runs and operate just as AV drilling between 30 and 45 wells on land actually doing drilling. Um, uh, even Bansi Partap, um, way back in 1868, um, had two shops, um, 350 acres of cocoa, but was paid handsomely for from royalties he did ex ex exceptionally well in royalties and he was the first indian to actually have wells drilled on his land 
um, it is estimated about 2 million barrels and became, I think, the first Indian millionaire in Trinidad uh, before 1900s. And so, and then move now to the multinational companies, companies that are right across the, the world. Um, recently, we saw Nutrimix, this company here, um, uh, open uh, a hatchery uh, uh, for about $80 million, uh, uh, capable of doing six, 3 million chicks per year. Uh, they are into feed mills, flour mills, poultry processing, etc. cetera. Um, and then low price group, this group here, um, they are in five industries, 15 subsidiaries, and four health sec four sectors, including fitness, hospitality, real estate, etc. Um, so, then, then, then I move to um, consume, global consumer brands, brands that are owned by Indian families that are, are in the global space. Um, I want to talk about Sasha Cosmetics particularly because here you have a company, a brand developed in Trinidad for multicultural women by a Trinidadian, currently in 60 countries. It was the official brand of 1999 Miss Universe supplied Miss USA with her cosmetic needs, Miss Panama and Miss Trinidad and Tobago and was named as the Caribbean Entrepreneur of the Year in 2016. So it's incredible, uh, but such companies, and you can do the same with Chubby, this brand of, uh, is in 65 different countries. Yeah, but I think I, I, I want to have a special place for women entrepreneurs, because I think for too often we talk about, we, we try to think that women were always secondary to the process. And I want to bring it to the front because almost in every major, companies, the women were either directly involved or behind the scenes. You have a small company here, a small shop here, if you can see it, um, called, um, I think it was a schoolboy parlor. It's, it was started by one Mrs. Toto Maharaj, um, and they were selling candies and sweets and snacks to children at the school. This is the birth of Arima Discount Mart and the Maharaj group of companies that currently has five supermarkets, a mall, a manufacturing facility and a major distributor. And you, you, you know, you, you go to see the Mrs. Bhagwan Singh, for example, here. I mean, now um, she was a, a, a woman who came from a, a business family, became a housewife, um, was given a, a, a driving cinema to operate, and moved on from a driving cinema to a clay block factory. Um, she now has five um, um, hardware, a plastic plant. Um, a aluminum plant and a steel plant. You know, so uh, similarly, uh, if you look at KC Confectionery, they are celebrating uh, 100 years this year of candy making. They started taking sugar cane and making and the juice and making candies with it. And then you have here Charan's, Charan's uh, Mrs. Uh, Bulbasia Charan, who started uh, a small shop under her house um, and then um, went into rice cultivation and was probably the first person to bring a rice mill into Trinidad to, uh, for, for the rice. But most importantly, it provided the opportunity for others to enter into agro-processing because with that mill, you were now able to do pepper sauces and other condiments and spices, etc. And then if we meet to medical facilities, uh, more than 80% of the medical uh, facilities in hospitals in Trinidad are Indian owned. Similarly, if you look at the other services, education, financial services, hotel and tourism, um, um, the Ishkal Baran Singh's hotel in, in Tobago, the first and only five-star hotel in Tobago, um, who is started as a taxi driver, went on to be a, a, into a car rental company and now uh, owns this fabulous hotel in Tobago. Um, similarly, Deloitte, when Deloitte was looking for a partner in Trinidad, they, they, they partnered with a small company called ID Rampasad, um, and today uh, employ more than 145 professional accountants to manage their, their facility. And it, it, the same applies for uh, Ishmael M. Khan, uh, uh, RIK Bookshop. These people started from in, in Barakpur from sugar and moved into 
uh, all the other facilities. And as for the future, I think the future looks very bright for us. Uh, there are some challenges, of course, but these are the finalists in 2020 um, of um, the, the, ch the Chamber uh, Awards for Excellence and for New Entrepreneurial Startup. So it looks very, very bright. And finally, I want to um, look at the recognition. For the first time for over the last five years, Indian owned companies and Indian owned CEOs are finally being recognized for their contribution. This is Mr. Bahadur Singh here, who developed the West Mall. Kamal Raj, who, Sasha Cosmetics, Ali Mohammed, SM Jalil, um, Helen Bhagwan Singh, um, Bhagwan Singh Hardware, um, Kusal, you know, and, 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 the, and the list go on. Ramps, um, um, Ramps um, uh, Logistics, with operations in Guyana, Trinidad, and, and, and Suriname. So finally, we see is a national recognition of Indian businesses as Indian companies, as Indians, as champions of business. Remember 145,000 people, Indians were brought to, 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 to China, of which currently we make up about 35% of the population. But in, in 1920, they were already employing 50,000 people. And in, in 2020, at the, the last count uh, on my research, the Indian businesses were employing more than 230,000 people, which is 64% of the labor force of the non, uh, sorry, of the private sector, i.e. non-government. They were supplying the majority of, of sugarcane, 100% of rice by 1920. Today, more than 60% of all the food that's grown locally is owned, is run and managed and grown by Indians. In 1920, 32% of the non-oil export were by Indian companies. Today, it is 52%. And therefore, we see that these companies have invested billions of dollars in every sector possible. Uh, in housing, in, in development of malls, in medical facilities, you know. They were also, also not only the facilitator, but also like the curator of, of, of schools and places of worship. And, 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 and having really, really good corporate communication. But again, it's part of their, their, their makeup, it's part of their, their culture, it's part of their dharma, it's part of their, their, no matter where you take it, it's part of that, that, that culture of giving back something. And finally, there was a recognition of, of the businesses uh, and the people we saw. Um, UWI in, 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 in Trinidad for the first time I'm honored with honorary doctorate uh, doctor's degree to five individuals and a lot of um, um, uh, recognition finally for uh, export of the year or champ of industry. But I want to close today by showing two frames. The, 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 this here is a picture of West Warren's and I want to show this because Westmore is 150 acres of land that was reclaimed and developed as one of the premier housing places in Trinidad with the largest single mall. And this entire development was done by one man who had the grit, the determination, and the vision for a better life, because it's ninety dollars in his pocket and his, uh, with him and his brother, the Bahadur Singh has established this development as the premier location in Trinidad and Tobago. And the Savannah, for, for, for two reasons: one, the backdrop there is a uh, the uh, Nicholas Towers here, twenty-two story Nicholas Towers, was built by a local company, the Rima, family-owned steel structures limited as the tallest building in Port Spain at that time. But I, I, I want to return to the, to the Savannah because this Savannah, which we call the Queen's Park Savannah today, was part of the 2000 acre Sharp Elysee Sugar Estate, or where in between 1870 and 1897, there was a small Tamil community that kept cows 
to graze in the savanna, uh, to cut grass and the milk. So they were bottling milk and selling the grass and the milk, direct delivery to the households in the, in the area. Uh, much like what Amazon was, is doing today, you know, just that we're doing it 140 years ago. Um, they call this, the Tamil community call this area Ram Katola, uh, because it was where they got their milk and their grass to support and, and supply and, 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 and raise funds. But again, as Jean-Claude mentioned about, about uh, horse racing, you know, um, the savanna was an area where horse racing took place. Um, and in 1874, the winner of the Governor's Cup and the Merchant Cup was a horse called Wild Dariel, owned by a shopkeeper named Arjun. And I see um, uh, Jean-Claude mentioned it as well. But the Indians would journey to look at the races and to cook mostly for their own consumption until the aroma was so awful, it was so overpowering and inviting that they began to satisfy the demand. And that signaled the birth of Indian delicacies, street food enjoyed daily, prepared and sold by more than 7,500 Indian entrepreneurs. I thank you. That's a wonderful way to end, Himraj. Thank you very much. Your presentation, as always, was so rich in detail. And I look forward to hearing the questions and comments from the audience. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to confirm before we move on, Mr. Sator Gafur, are you here and can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And wonderful. I can see you. Wonderful. So, ladies and gentlemen, we were waiting for Mr. Gafur prior to Mr. Ramdad, and um, now I'll take the opportunity to introduce him once again. Also, once again, to acknowledge Mrs. Amina Gafur and to say thank you very much for establishing the Amina Gafur Institute, which is the co host of this program. Mr. Sator Gafur is from Guyana. He is the chairman of the Gafur conglomerate based in Guyana with businesses in Barbados, Grenada and St. Lucia and perhaps elsewhere that we don't know about but which he will inform us about. He has been named in the who's who of the world 1999-2000. Gafur's has become a household name in Guyana but standing tall behind this empire is this very simple private man who has braved many storms to become one of Guyana's most successful businessmen and one in which we are all very, very proud in this diaspora. So I'm honored to welcome you, Mr. Gafur. Please go ahead and um, would you like to present now? Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Um, you can turn on uh, your video if you wish. Sorry, yeah. One minute, yes. What am I supposed to do? Okay, we are seeing you. Good. Yeah. Um, you like me to tell you my story? Is that it? A little about myself. It. Yes. Thank you. I was born in Barbies, which is about ninety miles from Georgetown, and um, in those days, going to school, no one wore shoes. Uh, I attended school in Barbies. And when I reached the age of about 11, my father thought it best that uh, he should move down from Barbies to Georgetown so that I can be better educated. There being no, you know, being, there being no high school in Barbies. I arrived in, we arrived in Georgetown in 1953 at the same time when there was a suspension of the, uh, of the government. And for the first time I saw people of white origin. There were army uh, with uh, soldiers all over the city. That was quite um, uh, uh, quite uh, difficult to understand why as a youngster. Anyway, I attended um, Central High School. And uh, in 1953, I attended school in May. I remained in school, but my father was quite ill. He suffered with 
in those days when the Indians suffered with an asthmatic condition, he did also do. So I left school for one term. When he got better, I went back to school and I remained in school. I wrote the, in those days, the um, College of Preceptors exam. And then in 1957, I wrote the, highest, the uh, Cambridge uh, exam. I left school, but um, sometime around, uh, uh, around me, the following year, 1958, my, my, my uncle, who was older than my father, saw me lifting cement and he thought, well, this was not right. He called my father, so I went back to school. I arrived in school um, in sixth form, but there had already been two, um, two, two terms that had already gone. So I borrowed books from, from other students within, within the sixth forum. I left school on 11th of May, 1959, and joined my father's business. It was a small business. When I joined, there were only two employees. One is a salesman and one is a little assistant. He had a very small lumber yard, and there, from there he sold lumber. When I joined the company, I added small items such as nails and barbed wire and the other things. And in those days, the only countries from which you could import were from the British countries or uh, from Europe, but not from the communist countries. In 1957, the late Dr. Cherry Jagan uh, opened the doors for import from any country. And from then we started to import from the communist countries from behind the Iron Curtain. That led to quite a success in our business and that developed in 1964, um, I was able, uh, being the first person in Guyana, to import from Japan. In those days, Japanese goods were of a good quality and very cheap. We made quite strides, quite some successes. That led from one thing to the other. In 19, 1970, I was in Trinidad and I met uh, a gentleman there and he discussed with me uh, an industry which uh, uh, was to cut glass into smaller sections, four inches and six inches, and have them polished. That led me into the in, into industry. We did extremely well with um, that product. We exported to many countries, including Trinidad, all the way up to Jamaica. That led from one industry to the other, and we were quite successful. My father died in 73 May, and then I took over the business. Um, we went into more manufacturing, and um, we did extremely well exporting to all the CARICOM countries, right all the way to Jamaica. That led me to own my own boats in which I loaded cargo for sailing to all the islands. That led to its own success. However, in 1976, Guyana started to experience a serious foreign exchange problem that led to the curtailment of, 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 of any item you require, unless you had a license. Such license were granted by the Guyana government, and none was granted unless there was foreign exchange. In uh, around 1980, my, no foreign exchange was in the country. My business went almost dead. So I migrated to Barbados with my family. I ran into some problem with then Burnham, uh, the prime minister at that time, and uh, I left the country. He, he said, Gafu, you can leave the country, but not, you can take nothing with you. I left uh, Guyana in August 1980 with three children, one a very small child, and we went to Barbados. I rented a flat, a uh, two-bedroom flat. Uh, my eldest sons had my eldest son to sleep outside. So those were the difficult difficulties that we faced. However, fortune smiled on me. And I was invited to New York by a company by the name of Item and a Company, with which we dealt for many years prior to going to Barbados. And they asked me, Gopu, what would you like? To, in what way can they help me? And I said, what I needed were raw materials and uh, machinery, which they gave to me, believe you me, in, in more than $3 million value, without me signing any document, just a word of honor. I did very well in Barbados, and that led me to, in 1980-something, uh, there was a hurricane in, in St. Lucia. I never saw what a hurricane can do to 
iron and steel. All these things were bent up. There was therefore a great need for corrugated sheets. And the same company, item and gave me a machinery and I established a business in, in St. Lucia. A similar thing happened in Dominica and the same thing I did. In 1984, um, there was a problem in Grenada. Those of us who know about the West Indies, um, the prime minister of that country was murdered and the, um, the, the Americans went into the country and overthrew. At that time, there were some Cubans that were in the country. And I was able to get uh, 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 one of the businesses there, one of the, one of the sheds, uh, one of the buildings that were built for the uh, uh, by, for the for the um, people in Grenada. I used that and I started a business in Grenada. So then, at that time, I had businesses in uh, Barbada, Guyana, Barbados, Grenada, Saint Lucia, and then later in Jamaica. The business in Jamaica, I later handed over to one of my brothers when my and one of my brothers was my partner died so that is um, where we are i my family and i returned to guyana um, after dr jagan visited barbados and suggested those who uh, were guyanese that they return and help to build the country my wife and i returned and we um, started back our business which was almost uh, uh, to a rundown to almost zero. Um, we started back all over and we were able to do quite well because at that time, after Burnham died, there was nothing in the country. So we were able to start all over back again and supply the needs of the country for rebuilding the country. And that led from one thing to the other. And today um, we have developments in housing, property development, um, we have land that was developed and rented to the ex one of the excellent subsidiaries. This today we have more than 1,200 people on our payroll, and that is it in a nutshell. Hello. Hello. Yes. Sorry, we lost you for a second there. We're hearing sorry. you now. So, sorry, I, I didn't get that. Hello. Yes, hello. We lost you for a second. Yes. Did you stop? Yes. Did, yeah. Did... Yeah. Okay. Um, where, where did you on, um, uh, so understand me? So the last thing that we heard was that you came back to Guyana and you restarted after Burnham died. Correct. We started back. My family and I returned from Barbados and we uh, resettled in Guyana. Fortunately, we had our, we did not sell our home. So we were able to go back to our home. Uh, the business was, you know, run down. So we started redevelop. And there was a great shortage of building materials. And we were able to fill that vacuum uh, because of the experience that we had in businesses. Today, we have one of the largest or the largest hardware business. We have uh, property development. I have uh, 100 acres, really 97 acres of land that is that are developed for and rented to one of excellent subsidiary. We have housing here. We are we are also we are residing. We are the uh, USA ambassador. We built a home for her, all in the same compound. Today we have over. Yeah, today we have over 1,200 employees on the payroll. We have about 200 persons who are constantly building for us. Presently, we're building. Presently, we're building some homes for the government, low-income homes. The president asked me, uh, invited me that since I am doing building and I, construction, and uh, since I have the really hardware materials, I must build houses, and he gave me a cost. A cost that below my cost. <laughs> but he said, Gafur, you made money. You have to do back something for your country. But um, we honor our corporate responsibility. We build homes for people free of cost. Last year, we built 10 homes for poor people who either were living in very squalid conditions. And it's pathetic to see the way, you know, they have to carry on their lives. So 
we condemn what they have, we built it, we build new homes for them. And that is our contribution. Besides which we have program, a program to help indigenous people who um, are very poor. Every month we give away uh, hampers um, at, the assistance, uh, at the assistance of my wife. I built a hospital um, for people who have di who need dialysis treatment. It's a Dubé Medical Center on the East Coast. Um, I think my wife is totally committed to it, to it. So much so that every morning when she was well, she would bring up a cup of tea and a banana, two bananas, two cups of tea. We sit down and discuss matters. The first thing on the topic was Dubé Medical Center. So one morning I said, okay, let us forget Dubé this morning. She said, well, as you mentioned, the name Dubé, this is what I want you to do. So that is her commitment. She is very committed to helping people. Um, she has sponsored a number of people to tertiary edu education. Up to, to about a month ago, we gave in Guyana dollars about, or in US dollars, about 30,000 US dollars to one student who wishes to pursue medical studies. That in a nutshell is our contribution to society, my business, and like everything else, that is it. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for sharing, Mr. Gafur. We have a number of people in the audience who will want to ask you some questions. Would you mind just sticking around with us a little longer? Certainly. Certainly. Terrific. Once I'm able to ask the question. Terrific. Thank you so much. We just want to invite um, a businesswoman from South Africa to speak for a few minutes, and she may also want to ask you a question, Mr. Gafur. So let me please invite now Mrs. Isevani um, Reddy, who is from South Africa. She's an accomplished businesswoman with over 30 years of experience in the petroleum, quick service restaurant, healthcare manufacturing, telecommunications, and distribution industry. Mrs. Reddy, would you like to go ahead, please? Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, it was really inspiring listening to um, all the people that had spoken before me, and especially how well we as Indians have done throughout the world. I just want to very quickly chat about not where we are, where our company is, but really about Indians from the time at the end of indenture. So when indenture, when the contracts with the first indenture in South Africa began to expire, some of our Indians decided that they don't want to work in the sugar cane fields any longer. And they decided that they wanted to uh, venture out and become in spite of their impoverishment and insecurity, they left the sugar cane plantations and risked their livelihood as market gardeners in the North of the city of Durban. So they full fresh. So it, this was their first entry into the cash economy. They filled their fresh produce in baskets and sold them mainly to our white counterparts in, in and around the areas. So with this new trend, they, they participated in the cash economy. Each gardener then progressed from carrying two baskets of vegetable to getting eventually their own wheelbarrows and a van. So if you look at the trend that we had throughout the world, including and part of it South Africa, we did very much the same thing that all the rest of us did throughout the world, just perseverance and hard work. Eventually, and I think one of the things that we really did was the culture of thriftiness and savings. So we established a strong culture of thriftiness and savings in South Africa. Some of us sold their produce to the Durban CBD and later we developed the morning market with very low overheads. And I found that these, if you listen to all the speakers before me, all of us carried and did the same trend. We worked accordingly. And I think that's inculcated in us as, as Indians. Um, when it came to our social strategy, 
we used our jointed and extended families as a, and family system as a social coping mechanism or strategy within a wider community, a supportive community. So there was a remarkable communal spirit. Everybody looked after everyone's child. Everyone was an auntie or an uncle or granny or grandfather. And that's how we save money. And more importantly, that's how all the kids were looked after, put through school and the rest of it. So this is the support system throughout our culture in South Africa was very strong. I'm talking about, you know, um, first generation, second generation. So then we also had something that we were very, we found to be very important was the culture of education. We had a very strong culture of education. We brought, you know, which we brought back from India. And um, they realized, we realized that education was, was escaped from the cycle of poverty. And this, this, this resulted in, in educational entrepreneurship. And that was also, you know, we, according in our, in South Africa, when you had finished school, our dreams, our parents and our grandparents was either you became a doctor or teacher or an attorney. And, and that continued, you know, there was always professionals in, 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 within the Indian culture and the Indian community in South Africa. We also saved. We were very thrifty. We were very um, interested or very, very um, strong when it came to our savings, saving our money and working towards a better future. And that's where we came, and that's where I think KZN and Oils had um, started. And if you look at my husband and what he did and what we did when we were working together from one company being in the fuel industry where we had supplied or we supply fuel and lubricants to the most of the places in South Africa nationally. Um, from there, things grew into a telecommunications company. We entered the food industry. We entered the health industry. We have our own logistics company. So very much like Mr. Gafur, we were, we worked, we found opportunity, and we took that opportunity and we made successes of everything we did. Having said that, um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to speak. I'd welcome any questions and on, I'd like to answer any questions that you may have. I think for me, just to end, us as Indians in throughout the world, we are strong, very strong nation, very, very, um, we're very pers we persevere with anything that we have, we, 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 we have or we attach to. And I think for us, that for me is what makes us also successful. Having said that, thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mrs. Reddy. We really appreciate all the information that you've shared. And um, you've actually pulled together everyone's presentations today. So I really appreciate that. And at this point in time, we will indeed open the floor for questions and comments. For those of you all who wish to ask questions, please use the reaction button. Just click on the raise hand icon so that I can call upon you. I see Veena Shetty with her hand up. Go ahead, Veena. Hi, I wanted to speak to the first, uh, I had a question for the first speaker. Uh, he mentioned a poem by Basawanna. Uh, I also want to uh, ask it, uh, you know, him to uh, uh, also go with the four principles of Hinduism, which is Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, and the Artha being the creation of wealth. So if you would like to talk about that being part of the culture. Yes, thank absolutely. You. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead. Very, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. Artha Kama Moksha, no, whatever uh, we have come here to do some work and uh, leave behind our footprints uh, to the society. That means the next two generation should uh, remember us what we have given to the society. That's what uh, it gives the Artha Kama Moksha Mada. So uh, the culture plays a very important role in uh, 
uh, bringing all these four put uh, four put together. Thanks for the question asked. Uh, of this artha kama moksha it is very well relevant thank you mr kamar we'll now take a question from dr durga go ahead please yes uh, good afternoon can you hear me yes good afternoon okay um i come from business as well always uh, my ancestors uh, immediately when the indentureship finished they started business my question to to the, the, the panelists is that, except Mr. Gafur, who slightly touched on the influence of doing business in a multicultural environment, where especially uh, we see in many countries, in the Caribbean, Guyana, Suriname, and I've seen what happened in South Africa lately, that the, the African community is, is in all cases, they see Indians as, as a problem. So the question is, have we thought about it and can the panelists shed some light on what is the solution? Because you, you live with all these communities and they will not go away. So we need to have a platform to work with them. Otherwise we will face what we have just seen in South Africa, what we have seen in the past in Guyana. In Suriname, it hasn't been that much, but it's also there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gafur, would you be able to respond to Mr. Durga's question? Yeah, I think one of the problems, uh, as you know, we live here in Guyana in a multicultural, multiracial uh, society. Um, when it, we have to understand that the people who came here, and I'm referring to Guyana, prior to us coming as Indians, were the Africans. And they have made a considerable contribution in the development of Guyana at that time. And they suffered tremendously. Um, as an African, they do see us as Indians coming and now reaping the benefits of their, of their, of their um, sweat. Um, you cannot prevent people from thinking that way. But what we have to do is try to understand and try to be part of the community. If we remain aloof, we would have problems. And that is one of the problems of Indians generally. They see themselves as they cling together and they do not see people of the other race or of other religions uh, that they can contribute, that they can be part of it and try to be um, understanding and at all times try to see in what way they can be of help to uh, uh, inter-religious and inter-community uh, uh, people. I think that if you play a part, recognize in their culture, uh, be part of their culture as they are to ours, I think to my mind that would lead to a more harmonious relationship. That's my personal feeling and I have African friends, I, um, I, I, I um, among them, but still at the same time, I maintain my culture, I respect theirs, but it's a question of some cohesiveness, cohesiveness that would ultimately, you know, break down this barrier. That's my, that's my feeling and that's the way I've, I've been successful among the African people. Thank you very much, Mr. Gafur. At the end of the day, human relations, good human relations um, would always take us through business. Yes. I think so. I totally support you on that. Thank you. Mrs. Reddy, would you like to add anything? Yes. Um, good evening. Good evening, everybody. In, 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 in my opinion, especially um, during what was happening in South Africa during July of last year, um, we do know as much as it was politically motivated, especially in KZN, uh, we also found that there's a lot of poverty. And what we decided as business with the municipality of KZN, the province, and the rest of South Africa is, basic, is to go back to basics, to go back to the townships and start teaching the youngsters, especially the youth, as to what it is to start businesses. So the, the plan is to go back to schools, start going and teaching them sport, going back and teaching them what it is that you need to do to get in, get uh, move forward in business. 
The other suggestion was businesses in South Africa, and especially in KZN, should now start taking the initiative uh, to start mentoring schools in particular and children. So I think for us in South Africa right now, and especially in KZN, we've decided that we wanted to go back to basics. We wanted to go back to the townships. We want to go back to the rural areas. And we wanted to start working to, with the elder, especially in, in South Africa, you find that there's a lot of um, grannies and elders that are looking after the youth and the children in the rural areas. We've decided that we needed to go back there and start engaging with them, start ensuring that the moms and the grannies have some kind of work to do. And uh, so they'll be able to sustain their families. Because as much as we went through what we did in South Africa in July, it boiled down to poverty. And I think when you're so hungry and you're so impoverished, the only alternative is to go and um, do riot and, and look for food or look for whatever you can just to survive. This is survival. So as a community in South Africa, amongst the Indians and amongst the rest of us as um, um, a country, we've decided that we needed to go back to basics and go back and start investing in our youth, more importantly. Terrific. It's remarkable that um, you've taken that perspective. It's important to understand human behavior in order for you to progress. Thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. We now have a question from Mr. Varendra Singh. Welcome, sir, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, it's been an incredible presentation. Um, uh, it's so funny, Ms. Reddy just echoed a lot of what I was gonna say. She was accurate about two things, which was she used the word head and inculcate. So true. Uh, I hope it's not the same with uh, Diana and Trinidad. South Africa had all that. We no longer have it. So um, we don't have the, 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 the support system she mentioned and everything about she mentioned totally had, no longer have. Um, something we always talked about amongst you know, kitchen conversation that's very important and that is we compared ourselves to the blacks and how much we've progressed and how little they did. And we came with nothing and got so much. The truth is we came with so much more. Mrs. Reddy said the word inculcate. We were inculcated for generations by our culture, by our traditions and our parents and everything we learned in India that was in grained in them consciously and subconsciously that when we came to countries, Guyana, Trinidad, Mauritius, South Africa, we automatically did what we learned from our grandparents in India. And therefore we were super successful. You cannot compare that to the blacks who did not have that in the African countries. And therefore, like she said, going back and helping them. And there's one way to cure our problem, simply, jobs, 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 teach, help. And of course, those of you who know that me building my senior center there with, a, um, with the seniors mentoring the, the kids that will come there for after school daycare, mentoring them in school and in the professions that the retired seniors will be um, imparting their knowledge. In that way, we feel we can spread our knowledge our wealth and our goodwill. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. Um, we have a question in the chat from Dr. Rosan Kanhai. She, she asks, there is much evidence of successful Indo businesses resulting in accusations of Indians taking too much. To what extent are Indo businesses engaged in community activities which could diffuse some ill feelings? Well, we had a response from Mr. Gafur already where he advised of the number of activities that they are involved in. And um, we'd like to hear from any of the other speakers. Himraj, would you like to address this? 
in your research, did you come across anything? Actually, uh, not much. I found that um, yeah. um, the, the research I found is that the, um, they are involved in more the cultural part. Um, so they will be involved in Diwali and uh, Eid and, and um, Pagwa and everything else, um, and NCIC, et cetera. Um, but not in the literature, not in the, in the other arts, not in, in I, I think the problem I have now, uh, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but the real issue for me going forward is can the new generation yeah, continue, to, to, continue to, to, to maintain that kind of momentum that we've had? Because it's a very different world. And if we go by the idea mentioned earlier about hierarchy decision making, we are facing problems because the world is different. These, especially Indian families who continue to work alone, and because there's no evidence whatsoever in the Trinidad context where there's linkages between uh, companies. There is no takeovers, there's no mergers, there's no acquisitions, right? there's no governance, there's no real good governance. And it worries me. It worries me that uh, recently there was, um, uh, Deloitte did something on um, best managed companies and our, Trinidad, our Indian based companies are not in the top three. So it is worrying, yeah, so that you have people who are, uh, are involved in the community, uh, but in a very uh, minimum way and only where it is highly visible in culture, nothing else. You want to get a book published? Oh no. Uh, you know, uh, you want to get uh, something else done. Uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is very um, discouraging in that respect. So I think, I'm not sure if it's a lack of uh, understanding or is appreciation for professional, uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm just throwing it out of the air. Yeah, Mike is off, Shalimo. Sorry, thank you. Chef Lord, would you like to add anything to that? Jacques yeah. Yeah, sorry. We can just uh, repeat the question again. Kind of got lost and everything there. Tangents and that's all. So we are trying to find out whether Indian businesses um, are sufficiently engaged in community service. Hello? I mean, yeah, I, I, I hear the question. Uh, when you say community service, uh, what exactly is the outcome of that community service going to be? NGO type organizations, um, what we call SEWA, right. service to the people. Right. I, because I, because I, Indians I, are perceived, sorry, Indians are perceived, um, uh, I suppose Dr. Kanhai is speaking to Trinidad and Tobago. Indians in Trinidad and Tobago are involved in business to the extent where Indians uh, appear to be taking too much. So we are earning too much. I disagree with that view. To, you know, to, to answer the question, I mean, I disagree with the view altogether. Uh, like that's why I said, like, what is the goal of you know the community service? Like, is it to uplift uh, uh, other ethnic groups or is it to uplift you know some of the more Country or community. This is my personal philosophy. I don't see the relationship between businesses and consumers extending beyond that. I'll go back to the example of Chang Bahari Singh. I believe it was in his part if it wasn't, but there was someone I researched who was a bicycle salesman and he helped many of the um, workers in the oil field who would have been predominantly African but also Indian as well. You know, the, the buses, the trains, they were running, and that he really was so bad. And just by him selling bikes, he helped uplift the community. He got people to work on time, people got money, they got paid, they got to build up the community, build their houses. So, you know, it, it's all a matter of what, what do the words mean when it's a community service? Yeah. It doesn't mean giving back some of the money they earn, or is it just a matter of providing a service to help people up build their own communities? So, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a much broader question than that. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we can have I, Mrs. Brenda Gopi Singh, who is can I come the, in? hello, we have Mrs. Brenda Gopi Singh, who would like to make a contribution. She is 
um, for want of a better word, known for regal products in Trinidad and Tobago. Mrs. Gopi Singh, go ahead and mute your mic, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good in afternoon. response to Roseanne, I think the corporate business, the corporate body of Indians in Trinidad contribute highly to community. It's not well known. In view of the fact that government provides most of what is bestowed on Afro community, we have to do things for ourselves and our contributions are focused on the Indian community, the Hindu community. We also have the Seva International that does a lot of work. They did a lot for the during the COVID. We also have the Inner Wheel Club, ladies um, out the part of the Rotary Club. All the Rotary Clubs consisting of business people contribute heavily, probably on a monthly basis, to do a lot of charity work. They give out wheelchairs. I think there's a project where they give land to certain people in small amounts to do planting, farming, that sort of thing. So there's a vast amount that is not known. For so my part, we, we, my, our business is in St. Augustine. We assist the community in various ways. A lot of Indians give money to the Mahasabha where things are, when it's announced, it is the Mahasabha doing. Similarly, when, when, when we contribute, like in my personal level, I have advertised on Jaguar tea on a program that was geared up to alcoholic families, um, mainly because it was least, least subscribed. So that it is a fact that Indians tend to give things for cultural events, fashion shows, and all these sorts of spectacular occasions. But it does not mean they do not contribute heavily to their communities. So I, I think you know, it can be expanded on. But there's a vast amount that people give willingly to the less fortunate, etc. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gopi Singh. We really appreciate your contribution. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Thank you to Mr. Vijay Kamar, Jean-Claude Escalante, Himraj Ramdat, Mr. Satur Gafur, and Mrs. Isevani Reddy. Thanks to all of you for participating and, and attending today's meeting. Unfortunately, it is now 5 p.m. and we need to close off the live stream, but to please hold on so that we can chat a little longer after. I will now ask Bindu to formally close the program. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Shalima of Trinidad and Tobago, folks. And thank you for being an excellent moderator once again. Now, folks, I will say thank you to you as well for taking the time to participate. Thanks very much to the presenters and the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir. Now, this is a team effort directed by people in the Indian diaspora. So we can call Ms. Shalima Mohammed and Mr. Sat Sukdeo from Trinidad, Dr. Tara Singh and Mark Lamden from New York, Boise Siu and Kasraj from Florida, Jai Says from Grenada, Lalita Adhin and Sharmila Ramutan from Suriname and others from South Africa. And also let's not forget our IT manager behind the scene, Ravan Ram Singh, who has been recording this program and will edit and upload it to your own website and to YouTube for prosperity. Now, as I have said before, this public meeting is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center in conjunction with the Amina Gafu Institute for the study of indentureship and its legacies led by Professor David Davide. Feel free to contact ICC to publish your books and reports. Send us your email addresses and WhatsApp number to continue build our database. In order to continue this weekly program and to make it bigger and better, we are kindly asking you to give us your suggestions as well as a donation. Please do contact Dr. Mahabir for details. Now our topic next Sunday will be the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's 
imminent impact on India and the Indian diaspora. Brilliant topic to look ahead to. And ladies and gentlemen, please do like, share, and follow our Facebook page. I am Bindu Devkinath Maharaj of Trinidad and Tobago saying goodbye. May God bless you all. Dhaniyavad. Namaste. Thanks to all of you for coming and attending and participating. It is really an honor to have all of these speakers here, particularly a giant like uh, Mr. Satu Gaful.